What's up, you guys? Some of you might remember this. Back in 1986, the world was watching on in anticipation as NASA prepared to launch the Challenger Space Shuttle. As we all know now, the excitement of that day took a very sharp turn only 73 seconds after the launch as the shuttle failed on live television, costing seven people their lives. How could a room full of some of the world's smartest people have gotten it so catastrophically wrong? Today, 30 some years later, the Challenger disaster is thought to have been caused by groupthink. Later investigations revealed that multiple scientists throughout NASA's chain of command knew that there were problems with the launch, but under incredible outside pressure to stick with the plan, go with the flow, you know, keep the higher ups happy, nobody said anything. Groupthink happens when the expectation for everyone to agree with each other and go along with the group consensus becomes so intense that it squashes our ability to safely express dissent, disagreement, and to have healthy debate with each other. This stuff isn't just lofty intellectual exercises. They're actually critical to making smart decisions together as a group and to forming more accurate beliefs. So how can we identify groupthink when it's happening? First, we need to be able to identify groups. Each of us has many in-groups. These are social groups that are usually formed around things that we have in common with other people. Many in-groups are formed around identities like political or religious affiliations, race, gender, sexuality, things like that. We also belong to our geographic in-groups, right? Your neighborhood, your city, your state, your country. We have teams and in-groups we're part of at work. We're members of online communities like this one or a subreddit or whatever. Researchers have been observing a certain in groupthink in recent years now that more and more people are getting their news and information on the internet. Obviously strong outside pressure like what NASA experienced creates kind of a high risk situation for groupthink. But another high risk situation is when an in-group feels threatened by an out-group. Perhaps physically threatened, but more often a threat to the group's values or their way of life or their identities. And when this happens, things can get very out of hand. Violence and all sorts of madness can be justified by the group, especially when they feel that traditional avenues of justice are broken. And that, my dears, is how groupthink can turn into a mob. Here are six ways to recognize groupthink in action. One of the key indicators that groupthink is happening is when people start to censor themselves. When people in a group are not free to express disagreements with each other for fear of social retaliation or being stigmatized, losing friends, losing jobs, things like that, in those situations, conformity is not just the comfortable option, it is the survival option. Now, you might be able to think of situations where self-censorship could be a good thing. We don't necessarily need to say every thought that crosses <laughs> our minds out loud, right? In some situations, the line between self-regulation and self-censorship might not be so clear. And when self-censorship becomes the social norm in a group, it creates an atmosphere that's ripe for manipulation, um, not even intentionally, by big extroverted personality types or by bullies. Self-censorship also creates the illusion that everyone in the group agrees with each other, when in reality they don't, so the truth goes unsaid. And that's why although it is very common in group think situations, it's not always easy to identify because how do you know when someone's censoring themselves? Fortunately, there are other red flags to look out for. Rationalizing is another red flag. Rationalizing harassment, rationalizing dehumanizing language or behavior or violence, rationalizing away evidence that contradicts with the group's beliefs. Alternative possibilities are brushed off and you know aren't meaningfully addressed. Another red flag that isn't always as obvious as it sounds like it should be is ultimatums. If you don't like what we decided here, then you can leave. If you don't go along with this, then people will die and it'll all be your fault. Could have just gone with the flow, man. Number four is an us versus them mentality. As an in-group becomes more and more uniform in their beliefs and they start weeding out undesirable thoughts and ideas, groups will often start to regard outsiders as bad people. You know, they're morally inferior, they have bad character, bad culture, whatever it may be. Stereotypes about the other flourish. This effectively allows groupthink to insulate itself and continue spiraling. Number five, complacency can also be a bad sign. This happens sometimes when a group starts to accrue some power or has had some success. From the NASA example, you know, we're NASA. We, we got this, we know what we're doing. When people let their guard down, groupthink might happen and it might also seem like it's not that big of a deal. And it's not really a big deal, at least until it is. 
The last red flag I'll talk about is moral talk. Groupthink might be present when a group of people start to rely solely on moral arguments to convince a group. We have to do this because anything else would be morally wrong. In this scenario, the pressure to self-censor just becomes tremendous because now disagreeing makes you a bad person. So it's very tricky and very convincing, especially because sometimes moral talk is needed. Sometimes issues of right and wrong are at hand. So I think it helps to sort of be on your guard and be aware that moral talk can be weaponized. It can be abused and has been throughout history by religious leaders, political leaders, cult leaders. <laughs> Considering these six indicators, it's pretty easy to see why groupthink has historically been especially common in religious and moral conflicts and in high stakes scenarios like in business or in war. Although, what's the difference? Sometimes just being aware that groupthink is a thing that happens and we do it is enough to kind of pump the brakes. In many situations, simply asking, hmm, could we be engaging in groupthink right now, is enough to sort of shake people into self-awareness and to redirect the conversation in a more open way. But beyond that, here are three methods that you can use to break up groupthink. One of my favorite methods is called the six hats. This method encourages us and our groups to consider a single problem from six different perspectives you know, wearing six hats. The logic hat, the emotions hat, the cautious hat, the optimistic hat, the creative let's get weird and think outside the box hat. And of course the practical, logistical, is this really feasible hat. A simplified version of this exercise that I've used on creative teams I've been a part of is to invite people to share their devil's advocate ideas and strategies as part of the brainstorming process. It takes the pressure off of people to just go along with it and you know, nod their head in agreement. And I think it encourages creative thinking. Another method, maybe for different situations, is to invite group members to share their feedback and critiques anonymously. This is especially helpful in my experience when there are people in a group who tend to have big personalities that dominate a discussion, or in situations where group members might feel some pressure to save face and not step on toes. Lastly, I have a more preventative approach. I think it's really important to you know, cultivate a, a norm and a tone that invites people to ask questions, that invites disagreement, that invites people to not conform and do their own thing. This comes back to a basic principle that I think we try to teach young adults and kids, which is, to be yourself, right? You don't need to do that thing or wear those clothes just because the popular kids are doing it. Free thinking is the grown up, sophisticated version of that. Cultivating that little bit of healthy mischief in ourselves or our kids or our groups, I, I think that can be a positive thing, you know, not cruelty and not being an edgelord for edgelord's sake, but simply to allow people to question things that might sometimes feel unquestionable. Use your power wisely, my dears. <laughs> <laughs> so this is effectively part two of my critical thinking guide that I posted a month or so ago. I'll put a link to that down below. Check it out if you're interested. I feel like these two videos go together very well to kind of audit our thinking processes. Of course, let me know what you guys think down below. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you next time.